Um, this is a very uh, kind of us here. We are going to have another speaker from Tibetan tradition. Uh, Venerable Geshe uh, Lakdo, who is the director of the Library of Tibetan work in the uh, Center of Tibetan Studies. So he is going to talk um, how to uh, find the happiness in the changing world. So I would like uh, him to uh, have about 20 minutes and then later that we can go have our time to talk and discuss later. Phone for you now. At the outset, I would like to wholeheartedly thank the organizers to try to fulfill the visions of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and following his directions. And I expect this is not only the first, but it will not be the last. So there will continue such dialogue and friendship at, at all levels, as I said this morning. So without wasting much time, I will start reading the two, three, four pages that I've written. And wherever possible and wherever time permits, I will inject some other relevant ideas into it. The topic of my talk is how to find happiness in a changing world. And this is really a big concern for many people. I'm very happy to be here at Bodh Gaya, which is in the World Heritage List in the year 2002 and inscribed as properties by the World Heritage Committee of United Nations of Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. Buddha gave 84,000 teachings during the course of his life. This very large number of teaching illustrates the idea that the Buddha's teachings are so extensive that people in all kinds of different situations can find within them something that meets their particular need. In fact, he gives here various levels of teachings to suit the various needs and mental dispositions of his followers. His teachings are based on the idea that all beings experience life as a cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. He taught that the aim is to escape from the cycle of suffering and that there is nothing about us or about what we experience that is eternal and unchanging. Flux is pervasive. Primarily, the Dharma he taught was essentially in accordance with the law of nature, and hence it is ahistorical. It speaks of universal truths and addresses the universal human situation, out of which one of the most important is our desire to have lasting happiness and to shun suffering. So the key question is how to obtain long-lasting happiness in an impermanent and changing world. He taught the wonderful path of finding happiness in our daily life and also to find lasting happiness in the form of achieving nirvan or complete enlightenment. So what is really important here, I think, is to get a clear idea. It is not how long you live by which you are ensured to have happiness, but you need to follow this technique to be happy each and every moment, not next year or uh, not after finishing the education and so forth. And here I will tell you a short story. In ancient India, there is a story of somebody who lived for 1,000 years. And because he lived for 1,000 years, during his lifetime, he married 100 wives and has 100 children. So when he reached 1,000 years, then the Lord, the messenger of death came and he said, you lived too long. He said, this is now your time to go. He said, no, I, I'm, I'm 1,000 years old, I know, but still I enjoy life, I want to live. But why don't you take one of my sons in, in place of me? My sons are also grown quite old, some of them like 89 or over 100 and things like that. So the Lord of the, the, the messenger of death approaches the, 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 the senior most son and he says, this is what your father says, you want to come with me? He said, no, I don't want to come. So similarly, there was nobody who wanted to die. Then finally he goes to the, the youngest son who was only 16 years old and he said, what about you? 
And he said, I'm ready to go. Then I said, how come you're so young? <laughs> Others who are much senior to you, they are not willing to go. How come you're, 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 you're very young? You're just to experience your life. He said, now having seen what my father is doing, what my elder brother is doing, you know, if they live for like more than 1,000 years, if they are not satisfied, this will be the same situation in me. So I don't want to live. I'm, I'm, I want to die. So this clearly tells that it is not how long you live but how you live that will make you happy. That is a very important point that we must know in today's world. So for this, it is important to first understand some of the silent features of law of nature, like law of causality and interconnected reality. And these are the topics that he taught, the Buddha taught right after his enlightenment. Therefore, the foundational view of philosophical tenet system of Buddhism, which distinguishes it from others, is the view of the four promulgations or axioms or seals, which are all conditioned things are impermanent, all contaminated things are suffering, all phenomena are selfless or without self, and transcendence of suffering is peace. These four are also referred to as four summaries, as it gives a summary explanation of both the conditional phenomena and the unconditional phenomena, given the inexhaustible nature and variety of the conditioned and unconditioned phenomena. Now, regarding impermanence about which I am asked to speak, it is important to recall the fact that impermanence was the first teaching that the Buddha gave after his enlightenment. Because after his enlightenment, the first teaching that he gave was the teaching on the Four Noble Truth, out of which uh, the first was the truth on truth of suffering. And when he, when he taught the truth of suffering, the, he taught the truth of suffering with four features, out of which first was impermanence. So that's important. And then the last teaching that he gave was also one of the last teachings that he gave us on impermanence. Because when he was passing and surrounded by his sanghas, he said, Behold now, brethren, I exhort you, saying, decays in inherent in all composite things, work out your salvation with diligence. So that was kind of the last teaching. Now a little bit about the meaning of impermanence. Impermanence could mean two things. It could mean non-existence, according to the explanation in the four seals, and it could also mean disintegration, as we normally understand. But in the teaching of the four promulgations, or four seals, it means non-existence, and non-abidance, and non-disintegration, because of the concept that all phenomena are empty, having no inherent existence. So from that point of view, impermanence means non-existence, not so much about disintegration. It is explained as non-existent because in the ultimate sense, all imputed phenomena of object and subject do not exist forever. That is the meaning of impermanence. It also has the meaning of non-abidance because there is no manifest thing like self and mind and so forth that abides without change. Therefore, here impermanent does not have the meaning of disintegration as is known in the ordinary world or as is not ordinarily understood when something disintegrates and becomes non-existent. So impermanence means having no permanence by nature from the purview of selflessness of phenomena, thus aggregates, elements, and so forth, having no entity is the meaning of impermanence as that selflessness of phenomena is always devoid of any entity of sub object and subject and that emptiness is no disintegration, and that which has no disintegration and always empty is the meaning of impermanence. According to untrained ordinary people, they think that until they die or between birth and death, there is abidance, there is stability. But in general, anything that is produced by its cause are, def indefin are definite to disintegrate, and the cause for the birth is the cause for the death. There is no other causes needed for death. So birth and death come into existence at the same time. In the case of a human being, right from the day it is born, birth and death have started moving together with the same speed, same pace. So impermanence is the feature of all conditioned phenomena, and impermanence in the form of death is the feature of sentient beings. According to our ordinary perception, the sun, moon, stars, and mountains seem to remain stable and unchanging, but in reality, they are all changing without remaining as it is even for a moment. When we use the term momentarily in impermanence, there are two types of momentariness, 
functional momentariness and momentary in the form of being the last duration. Functional momentary refers to the duration between the start of an action until its completion. Shortest moment or momentary in the form of being the last duration refers to the one part of the 365 parts of duration of snap of the finger. So perhaps it is correct to say that this mainly refers to an extremely short duration. That is the main idea. There are varieties in impermanence in terms of their subtlety. For example, in the case of a human being, he lives until he dies, and everybody knows that he will not live in the second moment after death. So this is very gross impermanence. The person living during the first moment does not live during the second moment, and this is more subtle. But the fact that it dis disintegrates in the very first moment is the subtlest. So the real meaning of impermanence is disintegration in that very moment of birth, and that birth itself is disintegration. So in the continuum of moments, there is no avoidance. So whatever type of condition, phenomena, they are not dependent upon a separate cause for their dis disintegration as the cause which produced, because the cause which produced itself is the cause of dis disintegration. So the disintegration is there with itself, right from the birth, and disintegration starts from the very first moment or from its very birth, or birth itself is disintegration. So all conditioned things do not remain as it is, even for a moment, and uh, therefore thus in the nature of change, and that is their mode of existence. Compounded things are produced by coming together of many causes and conditions. There are three things within the impermanent or conditioned phenomena, which are form, consciousness, and non-associated thing. Form refers to what has been formed from the subtle particles of the four elements. Consciousness is an energy that knows the objects like form, sound, etc. And non-associated thing refers to a class of things that are neither form nor consciousness. Human beings, animals, similarly the growth, existence, aging, disintegration of a tree or situation, uh, or situations and aspects of things which are neither form nor consciousness. Now, one thing that is really important for us to understand is not so much about whether the external things are impermanent or not, but the, the need to realize impermanence is the impermanence of our life. So I will discuss a little bit about the enigma of death. The key concern is not whether external things are impermanent or not, it is our impermanent life and death that is our headache. So the question is how to face this fragility of life and finally death. There are especially two major pro problems in today's modern world, today's modern world. Number one, the loss of collective societal myths having to do with the death and dying. And second, the systematic devaluations of anything to do with the spiritual side of humans. Number one, declination of spiritual uh, practices. Number two, hiding anything that they don't like, including death, and pretend that the death will never come. Although for tens and thousands of years humans accepted death as a natural part of life, a brutal revolution is in our attitudes concerning death occurred in the turn of the last century. What happened? Death became unnatural, according to the modern view. Death became unnatural, dirty, medicalized, and hidden from the public view. Whereas most people died at home in the 18s, 18,000s at least, by the mid 20th century, most people died in hospitals. Death was something that was not discussed. Dying patients were subject to the loving lie. Even if they're dying, they will never say you are, you are dying. They will tell a loving lie. People were suffering from, therefore people were suffering from the loneliness and isolation that our society fear of death caused them. Health, healthcare establishment dedicated to saving life, not facilitating death. Yes, healthcare is important, but how long we can take care of the health and never die. So we need to sooner or later also accept that fact that despite what you do, one day you have to face this uh, truth and reality of death. But now it is found, because truth is truth, gold will shine out, but now it is found through experiment, as was taught by the Buddha, that instead of death simply being the extinction of life, it is spiritually dynamic time with life-transforming insights. Death can happen to anyone. Destiny can strike suddenly, changing your life forever. In the Buddhist teaching, Tibetan Buddhist teaching, it says death is definite. 
time of death is indefinite. The only thing that is going to help you at the time of death is transformation of your mind, spiritual practices. So now scientists are also coming into this line. When there is birth, there will be death too. It is the universal law of nature, yet the human mind does not want to accept this truth. When a loved one dies, our mind becomes numb. We want to cling on, we refuse to let go because of our worldly attachment relationships. And not only that, there are many people who have wrong understanding of Buddhist teaching, because in Buddhism we talk about the, you know, suffering and the cause of suffering, and in fact, that is spoken in the very beginning. So therefore they say, Buddhism is a pessimistic religion. And I want to say Buddhism is not a pessimist religion, it is a realistic religion. It don't hide truth, because sooner or later you have to face that truth. Then another important point that I would like to mention here is, what is the point of talking about impermanence and death? What is the benefit? It only makes you miserable, it makes you depressed, and things like many people. I'll tell you how it transforms. Last year when I was giving a public teaching in Moscow, as usual, I was talking on topics like this, and then there was, a, there was a young man who got up and said, if everything is changing, impermanent, unreliable, then how can I love my girlfriend? <laughs> yes, that is how people think. Then I told him, if you really understand impermanence, not only you will love your girlfriend, but you will love your girlfriend much more than before. Because if everything is permanent, then why is the hurry? There's no hurry. But the fact is that everything is changing and death will come any time. Now is the time to live harmoniously, to love each other, to show affection to each other. So it is very, very transformative. And another very, very almost like mind-blasting teaching that I saw in one of the ancient Buddhist mind training texts, where he gives this point very clearly by saying that if there are three criminals who are caught and to be killed tonight at 10 p.m., so they have only five, six hours to live, so how should they live to together? Corruption? No. Exploiting each other? No. It's common sense, because they have only five, six hours to live, so none of the bad things, bad practices will come to their mind. They will only try to, the only natural sensible thing is, they will console each other, you know, say nice things, try to help each other. So I tell people, yes, because they have a short duration, you can easily understand that. But what about our situation? They are living six, five hours, six, five hours. We are living, for example, in this case, even, af even after I give you a big discount, we are going to live maximum 50 years, not more than that. Everybody will be dead after 50 years here. If, even after giving big discount. <laughs> so that is the situation. So once you know that, once you are convinced of that, not just talking, but you are convinced of this impermanent nature, then it only makes sense to live nicely, to live harmoniously, to help other, each other, and to you know, uh, uh, strengthen each other, to do good things. So therefore, I, I recently read one book where it says, talking about Buddhahood is easy, talking about enlightenment is easy, talking about nirvana is easy, but talk about impermanence and relate it to your life, meditate on that, Maintain mindfulness on that, there will be quantum leap. There will be quantum leap. All other practices, mindfulness, meditation, awareness, everything will come. Because even with the concentration, you know, like meditation on concentration, people talk so much about meditation concentration in these days. It's hitting headlines of Newsweek or New York Times and things like that. But people really have no idea what they are talking about. Because in Buddhism, when we talk about that concentration, Concentration is not just picking one object and concentrate on that. Concentration will come when you see the real nature of your life, the suffering nature, the impermanent nature. For example, if suddenly this building catches fire, nobody will sit here listening to me. They will try to save their life running hither and thither because there is no time to wait. S something must be done. So similarly, if we have this understanding of this uncertainty, indefiniteness of death, all other practices will come. But we don't have that understanding, most of us. Therefore, we always keep on planning, planning. I'll stay, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do that. And even if you go to an old man of 95 years old and ask him, are you going to die soon? He will say, yes, I'm going to die soon, I'm very old. Are you going to die today? Today, maybe not. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem. 
So therefore, finding happiness in a changing world is extremely important in the sense the more you understand this fragility, impermanence, death and so forth, the more you'll become, the more you will learn to live harmoniously, the more you will you know, talk about peace and so forth. And when this is not there, then there will always be the fighting. I, me, you, you know, as, as we have been, you know, taught in the Madhya Mika text. So I think that's enough. Thank you very much. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Venerable uh, Keshing uh, Lakdo from Tibetan tradition. Uh, we learn from the technique that he tell us how to approach the, the truth from different uh, area, which is the people, sometimes they ignore the reality of being, which is very interesting. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, the, the gentleman. Thank you very much for giving the opportunity. Uh, my utmost respect to the Sangha and my greetings, greetings to the lay community. Uh, I have a short question, more of a general one, and my question goes to uh, second speaker, Geshel Hakdurlah. Can you please light a wisdom on the question that does one should be ordained to achieve nirvana? If not, then what is the importance of being ordained? Thank you. To achieve nirvana, it is not necessary to get ordained. But then question continues, why then you people get ordained? <laughs> the reason that people get ordained is then you can really fully concentrate to achieve nirvana quickly. Okay? But this does not mean lay people cannot. For example, Dubna Chimdu Nejan Tarba Yu Pawe Yalu Marwala So Shi. Madhub Ringur Nejang Yusung Yu Chiva Sai Kungur Samji Hi. There's a famous teaching which says if you practice, even if you remain as a lay person, there is liberation like Marwa Lozawa and many other kings and translators in the past. And if you don't meditate, don't practice, even if you isolate yourself and stay high up in the mountain like a marmot, you will achieve nothing. But the reason that you, you know, renounce your house means then you have less things to do, less responsibility to carry, so you, your practice will be much more intense and much more quicker. Good. 